It's a big swing, and it's also a big salary cap eating swing. From Seattle's point of view, Bo, the reason I think that they lost the trade is they're going to have to pay Jamal Adams. Yeah, it's it's always good business, Nick, to, to pay someone two years early just because they demand it. The one thing I do not like about the trade from Seattle's standpoint is the failure to sign him to a new contract yeah. on the way through the door. You gave up two firsts mm -hmm. and a starting safety. Mm -hmm. They did. And the third one. And that's not it. You still have to pay him. Mm -hmm. He hasn't even got his contract yet. That's, that's what he's going to ask for. You still have to pay him. A national narrative has begun to take hold. Not only did our Seattle Seahawks get absolutely fleeced of their two first round picks and a third rounder, but in addition, they're gonna have to pay through the nose for Jamal Adams. He's gonna break the bank, back up the Brinks truck. Well, in this episode of the Hawks Nest, I'm gonna to attempt to dispel that narrative, take a wrecking ball to it, and explain to you actually why Jamal Adams is gonna to come to our Seattle Seahawks at a bargain rate. Yeah, I said it. A bargain rate. We're three days removed from one of the biggest trades in Seahawks history, and I still love the deal. In fact, I feel even better about it than first blush. There has been one minor annoyance, though, as this deal is discussed, one little irritant out there that's sort of grinding my gears a bit. And it's not just the talking heads or pundits. It's nationally even other teams' fans as they discuss this trade. Because while I can understand those out there, and I will concede a little ground to those out there who say the Seattle Seahawks gave up far too much draft capital in this deal. You don't give up first round picks in this day and age, not just for the potential good upper level player that you can get in the first round, but also because of the cheap rookie deal that you then get them on for potentially up to five years. I get where those people are coming from. I don't agree with that, but I get where they're coming from. It's those folks that then piggyback off of this initial solid point to say, and they're going to have to pay through the nose for Jamal Adams as well. He wants to be paid, wants to be paid right now. You're going to have to break your salary cap to get him inside it. $20 million a year. Let's go back a little bit, shall we? Hop in my DeLorean. Let's go back in time to the end of last year. Jamal Adams has just completed his third year in the league. He's just been named an All-Pro. And for those of you out there who aren't aware, an all-pro is different than a pro bowler. Pro bowlers come from each conference. A lot of the time, the guys don't go out there because they'll be injured or they just don't want to go. Or you got teams who are playing in the Super Bowl, have players who were elected who don't go. You end up with a lot of replacements. And in fact, you end up with a lot of expanded pro bowlers every year because of it. All pros, on the other hand, well, there's only one of those named every year for each position. Jamal Adams last year was named an All-Pro. year before, in 2018, he was named second team All-Pro. So, as anyone might think in his situation, he went to Jets management and said, hey, I outperformed my rookie deal. And the CBA says rookies, after their third year, can go back to the front office, back to management, and say, hey, I've outperformed this. Pay me a new deal. They can renegotiate. They can't renegotiate in the first two years of their rookie deal. So he came to the Jets and said that. He said, I want you to pay me top of the market. And not only are you going to pay me top of the market, you're going to go a little bit beyond that because you've surrounded me with complete and utter trash over the last three years. I got to be Superman out here every week, dodging kryptonite, and I've got no Batman. I've got no Wonder Woman. I got no even Aquaman. I'm out here doing this by myself pretty much. Sam Darnold isn't taking that step forward you all promised. He's certainly not in line with the other guys that were drafted in the same draft. The other quarterbacks drafted in the same draft are outperforming him. And let's face it, Adam Gase hasn't exactly proved to be that defensive, offensive mastermind that you all sold me on him being. So you will pay me, New York Jets. And the front office looked at him. They said, oh, I don't know. He said, you're going to pay me a couple extra million alone just for Adam Gase and his googly eyes. I got to have this guy trying to motivate me every week. Let's get it, fellas. Here we go. I'm gonna really attack this week. Go after this defense with my offense and I am brilliant. 
the judge journal manager got a little creative here. Instead of just saying flat out, no, we've got the leverage. We can sit on you for two years and you got to just sit and spin. Instead, he went at it from a different tactical approach, it would seem. And props goes to the New York media on this because they were the dogged ones to sort of figure this out and find this out or at least report it. And that is, okay, Jamal, you want to get paid? You want your money? You got two paths you can pick. One path, you go get paid every last red nickel and cent. But you're going to go to a horrible team in an awful city. Or you can go down this path. And down this other path, you can actually play for a decent team, a contending team. But the caveat with choosing that path is that you do not get paid initially. No promises. And Jamal Adams, that guy that everybody's telling us is the money grumper. It's all about the money. It's all about him. He's a me guy. That guy looked at those two paths and he took the second one. He submitted a list of seven teams to the New York Jets that he was willing to be traded to. And oh my goodness, surprise, surprise me. Seattle Seahawks just happened to be one of those teams. So when Seattle, people go out and they say, oh, you're overpaying, understand the agreement was you go to a contending team, you don't get paid initially. And now we're starting to see the reports come out. Finally, I'm hearing today more and more people starting to come to the realization that he will play his rookie year out and his rookie year out is going to be played at $3.6 million. That's what it's going to cost the Seahawks. The Jets already ate the other bonus money that was on the deal when they made the trade. Bradley McDougal on the other side of it is actually being paid about $500,000 more in all of the offsets and dead money. So Seattle essentially out the gate in this trade saves $500,000. And you get a prime year of Jamal Adams at $3.6 million. This is where you've got to differentiate it from the Laramie Tunsil trade and the Khalil Mack trade. Khalil Mack wanted to be paid initially on the door. As I walk in, pay me top of the market, break the market for the new deal for me. That's not what Jamal Adams is doing here. Laramie Tunsil was a deal that was made where he was also, so you also retrieved two first round picks from the Houston Texans to get him over there. And that was a, a move of desperation. And they have now overpaid Laramie Tunsil. But Laramie Tunsil as a left tackle versus Jamal Adams as a safety are two different beasts. Jamal Adams is a much better safety than Laramie Tunsil is a left tackle. Be great. Be great. And this is Murray. Boy, did he take a lick. The ball. The ball. All right, we've taken Bradley McDougal. Flopped him out for Jamal Adams and saved $500,000 in the first year. What about what is to come? Well, let's operate under a couple of different scenarios. The first scenario I want to operate off of is essentially that the Seahawks are going to end up re-signing him after this season. I will anticipate that Jamal Adams will ball out for all of you. It's going to cost the bank crowd. Let's throw that anticipation out there. So he balls out. Seattle is going to agree to re-sign him then to a new contract after this year when you paid him $3.6 million. I don't think he's going to get $20 million. I think that was the Jets asking price if he was going to have to play there in that crap show, not being on a winner. Here on a winner with Russell Wilson, with what he has around on him, I'm not expecting him to take a massive discount off of what he was asking. We'll be, we'll be within reason here, but he's not going to get $20 million per season. So, okay, let's go with $18 million per year. Jamal Adams, after this year, if everything fits to what we know and how Seattle tends to do their contract extensions, which they tend to go by four-year extensions, if not shorter, they will sign him to a four-year extension at that time. And if I say it's in the $18 million range, you're looking at four years at $72 million. I still think that's even going to be a little bit higher than where they're going to need. I think eventually they'll be able to settle this out at about $16 million per. But what I'm anticipating is this. Earl Thomas last year got paid approximately around the $14 million per year range. It was reported at first that he was getting $40 million in bonus money, but it was actually about $20 million in bonus money. So Earl kind of reset that market at $14 million. Tyron Mathau right in the same place. I would expect Minka Fitzpatrick and probably somebody else to then now push it into the 15 to 16 range. And so Jamal Adams after next year will be the next span up at that point and due to make that $17 to $18 million range. So you've got four years, $72 million. 
You can structure things and how the yearly hit will go. As far as the first year, it's going to be $11 million. You could do the second year at 17, third year at 19, fourth year at 23 million. And with the way you would probably structure the bonus money being about $40 million guaranteed or $10 million per year of the contract, you could still get out of that third year if he totally falls off at a player in his late 20s and only have to take then that $10 million dead cap hit if it all goes to hell. But let's not anticipate it going to hell. Let's say he continues to be a very good player through that time. That means at the end of that contract, you will have then gotten that player for a five-year deal at about $75.5 million per year. Or approximately that will have about taken up about 8.5% of your cap and lowering through the course of the career of the deal because the cap will eventually go back up again here after it stagnates for a year or two. So at the end of the deal on that, you're not paying that much for the safety. It breaks out to actually less than the 18 million per because you have to factor in that first year where you got them on the cheap rate at $3.6 million. It actually boils down at that point to you paying about 15 and a half, $16 million per year. And that's if you have to pay them at 18, which I think we're actually going to be able to sign them around that $16 million per range, which even lowers it further. And to give you some context on this, you could have him signed at this range and put his contract with Russell Wilson's contract, and that's still less than a quarter of the cap on a $200 million salary cap. So the cost is not that expensive. But if I still don't have you convinced, let me give you one, let me give you one last here cherry on top of my pie, okay? The other factor people are not thinking about here, which does factor in even if it's just a little bit, is what a first round pick costs. And what I mean by that is that when you get a first round pick, you're not just getting it, it ain't free money. You do have to spend on that, that first round pick. It does count against your cap. So if we look for some context here, we have Jordan Brooks, who just signed a four-year deal, which pays him on average about $3.1 million per over the course of that contract. So when you look at Seattle in this deal, and the part no one at all is talking about, and maybe it's such a small item it's not worthy, but I think it is, is that you have two first-round picks in this particular deal. And first-round picks year in and year out are going to get a little bit more than the last first-round pick in the very same slot of that first round. So if he's getting 3.1, you can probably factor in next year, it's gonna be 3.2, 3.3 to that first round pick on average per deal. That's $3.3 million that the Seahawks are going to save that they would have to have had allotted to their salary cap. And it gets even better from there because when you get into year two, salary probably goes up even more, but let's just say we double that to 6 million for that one first round pick. But then the second first round pick clicks in as well. So that's another guy that you're potentially at three and a half million dollars in savings on. You start to see how this can compound where over the course of a three year period, you could be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to $25 million in savings of what you're not paying to the first round picks at that point because you have dealt them. It's, a, it's an upside to the deal nobody probably really considers, but it's an upside worth noting when we're talking about the true value of what this guy's gonna cost us in dollars and cents. I'm gonna catch a body, I don't know who we're gonna be though. I'm gonna have to catch a body out here. I gotta turn this up. Man, look here, man. I'm trying to win. I could have really killed him. I could have really hit his ass. I ain't even, I, you know, love tap, love tap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he got mad. That's how you feel. I ain't hit him that hard, though. You know me. Look, DJ, you know me, bro. You went to college with me, bro. I ain't hit him like that. In this market, if you believe having five of the best years of a Hall of Fame player's career, regardless of position, fitted into a well-structured deal that is a little bit maybe below market rate as far as how it really plays out, if you think that's a bad deal at that point as far as in a dollars and cents standpoint, we're just going to agree to disagree there. I don't. I'll take that all day for a Hall of Fame football player, or at least a player who's on a Hall of Fame trajectory. Maybe he won't reach there, but he's certainly on that path. Because let's not forget this guy's still under 25 years old. He's still younger than last year's first round pick, LJ Collier. And look at all he's accomplished. Bottom line, Seahawks fans, it's okay to lament the loss of the two first round picks in the third rounder. I get it. I understand. But don't get caught up on the cost of Jamal Adams himself. He's not going to wreck the salary cap. 
In fact, you could end up getting five of the prime years of Jamal Adams' career, a career that's on a Hall of Fame ascent, and dare I say, a bargain rate. My name is Brandon. This is the Hawk's Nest. Thank you for watching. And don't you forget, don't you ever forget. Go Hawks. A safety two years early. That was, that was Nick's initial argument. And he said first team all pro. Wasn't Mitch Trubisky first team all pro a couple years ago?